Just as the sun is dominant in the daytime, so at night it is the turn of the moon. Our faithful companion to space, staying with us in our never-ending journey around the sun, and by far the closest natural object in the sky. Everyone has looked at the moon and marvelled at it and looked for the man in the moon, but what is the moon really like? This poem is going to be all about the moon. I'll be talking to a historian, Dr. Alan Chapman, about the moon mappers, and in my observatory, Chris will be joined by Pete Lawrence and lunar geologist Dr. Ian Crawford. So, first of all, let's begin by going outside and joining Chris to look at the moon. It's a beautiful night and the moon is shining down on Patrick's observatory behind me where the 15 inch is ready to look up at its familiar face. I say familiar face because it keeps the same side turned towards us here on Earth throughout its 27 and a bit day orbit as it moves around the Earth. Now, although it keeps the same face turned towards us here on Earth, it's pointing a different face all the time towards the sun. And so we watch the progress from night to day over the course of a month. Start with new moon, where we can't see any of the illuminated surface. Then through the thinnest of crescents, then onwards to first quarter with half of the moon illuminated. Then a waxing gibbous phase between first quarter and full moon, finally. Now, I made the mistake when I started looking that full moon must be the best time to look at the moon. And it isn't. At full moon, the sun is shining straight down onto the lunar surface. There are no shadows visible, and that makes features rather hard to pick out. What you want to do is look at the terminator, the line between night and day, between light and dark on the surface of the moon. There, the sun's low in the sky. You see the shadows of mountains, you see craters, and you see the real features of the moon. There's always plenty to see on the, on the moon, and we've done plenty of programmes about lunar mapping. Look back now to 1960. At the present moment, uh, the moon is about half. And if you look at it through any small telescope, you'll be able to see not only the dark patches, which we miscall seas, but also these craters, these circular walled formations, which seem to cover most of the moon. Well, you can see the dark seas even without a telescope at all. Because after all, the moon is by very much our nearest neighbour in space. Our nearest natural neighbour, that's to say. Moon mapping, one of my own particular hobbies. I'm delighted to welcome back one of our regular guests, uh, Dr Alan Chapman. Welcome back, Alan. It's always a great pleasure to be back, Patrick. Well, of course, moon mapping goes back a long way. It does indeed. In fact, the first early people to talk about it were people like the Roman natural historian yes. Pliny, yes. who in about 70 AD mentions drawing the moon and the features you could see upon it. But it's really the telescope that brings moon mapping in in a serious way. Even so, we had one naked eye map before. We had Gilbert's map. You I had published posthumously, I know. But it did show the moon as seen with the naked eye. You did indeed. And of course, Gilbert's map, of course, the famous geomagnetist, uh, he does his drawing of the map in probably about 1590. Uh, but it's really when you start to get the telescope that you start to see things on the moon unlike ever before. And the first one was an Englishman, Harriet. The first one was an Englishman, Thomas Harriet. And he did it with a small telescope which he either made himself or acquired from Paris. Um, tragically, it wasn't published until, well, many, many years later. And I think the reason is, is that he was, he'd been partly implicated in the gunpowder plot a few years before. And he wanted to keep his head down. His map took some tracking down. In fact, I, I tracked it down myself. Yes. I had it published. Absolutely. And it's a very, very important work because it shows a lot of features <coughs> and gets a great deal of material right. But the first great telescopic observer was, of course, Galileo. He paid attention to the moon. He did indeed. And when he made his first telescope, he started to observe the moon with great care. And he noticed the moon had mountains. The moon had large, rugged, rough plains and large, flat areas, which he called maria, seas. Now, of course, whether he thought they contained water or not, we're not really quite sure. And suddenly he realised that the moon was a world. But let's bear in mind, Galileo had a very, very poor telescope, and it was more or less like this one. It would have had two lenses, a simple object glass here, and what we call a negative eyepiece at this end. And the view you would have got with it would have been very tiny. Now, you think of this. If you took a card with a hole in it, maybe about an inch in diameter, and a globe of this size, and you passed that over the face of your globe, you would see about as much through that hole as Galileo saw of the moon's surface. And one of the reasons why we now know some of the features he drew were in the wrong places 
is because, of course, he couldn't actually see the whole moon and be quite sure where the coordinates fitted. But he could see the mountains and even made an effort to measure their heights and didn't get anything wrong either. He was quite right. He actually used shadows from what's called the lunar quadrature when it was known that the moon was at 90 degrees with the Earth and measured some of the mountains which he called the Apennines, named after the, the mountains that go down Italy, and said that some of these mountains on the moon were over six miles high. And that was astonishing because they already knew by that time that the moon was only a quarter as big as the Earth, but it had mountains that were so colossal. And this was literally a world like nobody had ever known of before. Quite fascinating. And uh, at this moment, out in my garden, Chris and Lunar Geologist Dr Ian Crawford are looking at the moon. Well, we've come outside and done what people have been doing for millions of years, looked up and seen the moon. And the first thing you notice is that there are light and dark areas. They look like seas, but they're not yes. seas, uh, of well, course. Well, absolutely. The early observers saw they were smooth and flat and thought they might literally be seas. We now know they're, they're, they're frozen lava. So... Um, the dark areas are a, a dark um, basaltic lava. Oh, I've got a piece here, this is not a piece of moon rock, but it's a piece of earth lava. It's very dark, very dark rock, which has filled in, flooded, huge impact basins, essentially very large impact craters on the, on, on the near side of the moon. And what about the light areas? The, the light areas are the, orig the original crust of the moon, into which these meteorites impacted to make the big craters in the first place. Now let's go on a little tour of how, how the moon looks to the naked eye. We've got one particular phase tonight. What are the main seas that we can, we can see? Well, well, even with the naked eye, you can, you can see the, the largest of the near side, Mare, which is Mare Imbrium, Sea of Rains. Uh, to the east of that is Mare Serenitatis, the Sea of Serenity. Um, south of that is the Sea of Tranquility, where the Apollo 11 astronauts first landed in 1969. Um, and north east of both of those is a very well-defined, very circular feature called Mare Crisium, the Sea of Crises. And of course, to get more detail, we need optical aid. But looking in binoculars, you begin to see other features as well, not just the Mare. For example, mountain ranges. Uh, yes, absolutely. The lunar Apennines are the clearest to see tonight. Which, oh, yes. Which form part, part of the rim of the imbrium impact basin. The reason these mountains are all uh, concentric with the basins is they're the rim of giant impact craters effectively. Now of course the other feature that you can't escape when you look through binoculars are craters and there are a few visible tonight. Uh, th there are some of the larger craters are well visible through even quite small pair of binoculars, especially along the Terminator. There's the obvious one in the centre, is that Copernicus? Uh, Copernicus is very prominent, very close to the Terminator, so the Terminator is the boundary between light and dark. And so if you're on the Terminator, the sun is very low in the sky, it's casting shadows, which makes craters very easy to see. Um, Copernicus is a large crater, about 100 kilometres in diameter, and very, very prominent this evening. But if you look all the way around the edge of the Terminator, where the sun is low in the sky, you can see scores of craters. And of course, that leads to the question, what caused them? Well... They asked this question back in the 17th century as well, and earlier today we set out to replicate an experiment first carried out by Robert Hooke, firing a projectile into wet clay. We now know that the lunar craters are due to impacts, things coming in from space and hitting the lunar surface. But a long time ago, this was an idea, and actual experiments were tried. Alden. In 1664, Robert Hooke suggested to the Royal Society that the lunar craters looked like impacts, and he performed a series of experiments of firing lead bullets into what he called a well-tempered mixture of tobacco pipe clay. We're not going to use a gun now, but we're going to try a catapult right. into a bowl of pipe clay. Imagine this, flying in from the outer solar system, past Saturn, past Jupiter, past Mars, approaching Earth. I was just within spray range, too. <laughs> Do you know, Patrick, you look a bit like a Dalmatian. Thank you very much. Well, I think um, he did a very good job there. I think it came over very well. I think Robert Hooke might have been proud of us. Because what we've got on here are the basic features of a lunar crater. You notice the ramparts, you notice the depth. It's maybe a little bit deep because we're dealing with this slightly, maybe a sloppy material. But we've really got something which looks rather like a lunar crater. Hooke was a fascinating man. Robert Hooke was a remarkable character, and he's the first person, I think, to actually what you would call try to model astronomical phenomena in the laboratory. And this idea of firing bullets into plaster of Paris is really the beginning of lunar modelling. Now, what he did was also to do the first ever detailed drawings of single lunar features. And in Micrographia, yes. which he published in January 1665, he publishes this wonderful picture 
of the complex of craters around Hipparchus. And also, too, a few years ago, a friend of mine called Gain Lee, an amateur astronomer of Huddersfield, photographed exactly the same structure as Hooke did. And it's astonishing how good a lunar draftsman Hooke was. I've actually suggested that when you measure that whole structure, Hooke was measuring down to at least three or four arc seconds in his draftsmanship, which is quite spectacular. This is amazing. And, of course, what Hooke was doing as well was not just modelling the lunar surface, he was actually taking a candle, he tells us, and moving his candle over his Plaster of Paris experiment and saying it looked just like the lunar surface. So he's not only modelling the lunar surface, he's even using a candle to model shadows. And this is really the kind of stuff we think of as modern, but this is 350 years ago. Well, I didn't use a candle, but in 1960... I did something of the same kind of the sky at night program, showing how the changing shadows alter the appearance of a lunar crater. I've made a model of a typical lunar crater, and I'm going to show you the progress of sunrise over it. I'm going to illuminate it from the side by means of a lamp, and I think for this we'd better have the studio lights out. Now, first of all, when the sun first appears over the crater, it illuminates only one wall. Then you can see the complete circle, and as the sun slowly rises, you get the central peak, the shadows inside draw back, until finally, when the sun is high over the crater, there's no shadow left inside it at all. Now, that process, as I did it then, takes only a few seconds. Of course, on the moon, really, it takes some time, because the moon spins very slowly. I think that was fairly graphic, too. But after Hook, there was a long period when nothing much happened, and then we come to the first of the really great boom observers, Schroeter. Absolutely. Schroeter was important, largely because, of course, of the new quality of telescopes. And he was probably to be the first great lunar observer to use reflectors. And he was working with tremendous magnifications. He wasn't a terribly good draftsman, but in fact, tragically, the French armies mm. under Bonaparte destroyed his observatory and burned most of his papers. But then, really, once you get into the 19th century, oh, yeah. you then you have uh, two Germans, Beer and Mardler, who do the first really good modern study. They used a small telescope, the three and three quarter inch refractor in Beer's observatory, and they produced a map of the moon, which was really the best of its time and is still good even today. So now let's go back into the garden, where Chris is joined by Ian Crawford and also astrophotographer Pete Lawrence. You can see a lot with even the smallest telescope on the moon, and that's exactly what we've got here. That's right, we've got a, a, an 80 millimeter telescope connected to a, um, a simple video camera and the video camera is feeding into a monitor so we can all see the, the image. And, Absolutely, uh, although we have to remember that when you look at the moon through a telescope, it's reversed, so south is at the top and we'll do that all evening. But even though that's confusing, I can see we've clearly got the Mare Imbrium in shot right now. Yes, this is an outstanding view of the Mare Imbrium ringed by the, the mountain ranges that, that surround it, like the lunar Apennines. Prominent crater is Copernicus, and off to the east is the Sea of Serenity, Mare Serenitatis. And there's that ray running straight uh, Absolutely, through. there's a bright ray that runs straight across Serenitatis, and that's actually a ray of uh, Tycho ejector, and Tycho is half the way around the moon from Serenitatis. But Pete, there's a smaller version of that in the top left. What crater is that up there? That's Proclus. Um, that looks almost three-dimensional, doesn't it, on the monitor there? Yes. Yeah. Well, what's very interesting about Proclus there is the ray pattern is not symmetrical. This happens when a meteorite collides with the moon at a low angle, and the rays are shot forwards, leaving an area behind um, downrange of the impactor, which isn't covered in light-coloured rays. Plenty of seas in this image, Chrysium off to the left, and then, right. of course, we've talked about Serenitatis, but that's the Sea of Tranquility in the centre there as well. And there seems to be a colour difference. Is that real? Yes, it is real, yes, it's certainly a brightness difference. The Sea of Tranquility lavas are noticeably darker because they're very rich in the element titanium, which we know incidentally because of course Apollo 11 landed in the Sea of Tranquility, so we have samples of those, those lavas uh, to study in the laboratory. Okay, where to next, Pete? Well, let's wander back um, towards the, the Terminator, see what we can see down there. We've got uh, Copernicus there, very, very clear. In fact, if you go north of Copernicus, we can see uh, a wrinkle ridge, I think. Uh, yes, just, just there, very close in. Now, oh, yes. what on earth is a wrinkle ridge? Um, these are thought to be produced by the mare basalts as they cool and sink into the basins that they're filling, crunching up at the, uh, on their upper surface into these relatively low, sort of few hundred metre high um, ridges, called wrinkle ridges. And that one, that's a particularly nice example, of course. You only see them on the Terminator. 
Yes, that's right, when the, the lightings are bleak like that. Well, Pete, while we're here, let's head to the far south. Okay. It's much easier on the moon than it is on the Earth, of course. Just yes. move the telescope. It is. It's a very heavily cratered region in the far south, of course. And um, what can we see there? There's a good um, relief on Clavius, actually. Clavius is a, a superb feature. It's a, a very... Um, a very popular feature with amateur astronomers who like to uh, to take photographs of it and draw it, and it has a there's a sequence of craters actually within Clavius that gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and they're, they're a very good test of a telescope's resolution. And slightly to the north of Clavius, that's there, down on the image, of course. That's down on the image is Tycho, which is a, a brilliant ray crater. But the rays aren't obvious under this illumination, are they? No, they're not. They're not as striking as they would be, say, under full moon. And in fact, there's quite a bit of relief inside Tycho itself, as you can see there. There's quite there's a nice um, shadow there. You can see the rim shadow. And and we can also see the central peak, which we haven't central mentioned. Central peak's very clear, isn't it? Yeah, yes. it's uh, very Good. clear indeed. Because, Ian, it's crucial, isn't it? These craters do have central peaks, yeah. unlike the one we created earlier. Absolutely. One of the first things you notice looking at the moon through a small telescope is that most of the craters have these central mountains that catch the light and make them very, very obvious as a bullseye with a bright patch in the middle. Um, the reason that impact craters have, have a central peak is that after a meteorite s smashes into the lunar surface, it excavates material which is thrown about, but then the floor of that cavity rebounds into a, a hill. Well, here we're in, well into the realm of lunar geology, so it's time to return to Patrick and Alan and the 19th century. Let's come on now to the first real lunar geologists. It was in the 19th century that people started trying to model the moon again after Hooke, and a number of people got interested in this business. One question was, was the moon actually changing? And one of the first and the most ingenious of these people to do this was a Scottish ironmaster called James Naismith. And he had a great blast furnace in Manchester. And he suggested that the moon had once been rather like a molten iron ball, because he'd noticed that the kind of what he called scoria, or scum, that you got on the top of molten iron looked very, very similar to lunar features. And this led him to a fascination by the formation of the lunar surface. Now, because he owned a great engineering factory, he was able to make superb large telescopes and was able to make very, very fine high-definition drawings of the moon. But the problem was, at first, you couldn't photograph the moon because the early emulsions wouldn't make it possible. And the pictures which, which actually were published by Naismith, he'd actually taken beautiful models from his drawings of the lunar surface and photographed the models. And people often even mistake these to this day for real pictures of the moon. But then, of course, lunar photography begins in a really serious way with another amateur, a paper manufacturer from Guernsey called Warren de la Rue, oh, yes. who had a very, very fine telescope. And I have here some original photographs which he took. And these are pretty decent. They are. And these are done between about 1858 and about 1863, and a whole collection of them and going through the entire lunar phase. Now, people like Delarue were really interested on the one hand, the technology for mapping, the nature of photography, the nature of actually forming images of the lunar surface with Naismith. But then, the man who really opened the whole debate about change on the moon's surface was the German astronomer Julius Schmidt. And in 1865, he would thought he'd seen a change on the lunar surface in a crater called Linné. He thought it had vanished. And this led to a whole new discussion in European and American astronomical circles. Was the moon changing? Well, Linné is fascinating. So in the Marius Venetatis, and Bier and Madler had drawn a deep ferrocrystic to a small crater and called it Linné. 1865, Schmidt looked at it. He couldn't see Linné. He only see a white patch there. So... Um, Let's go to our tribes over there and look at it. Well, I can see Linné tonight and it looks like a white spot. What's happening is that we only see the deep crater when the lighting is just right and the rest of the time we pick up a deposit of light material around the edge of the crater. It's wonderful to be using Patrick's 15 inch to look at the moon. It's what the telescope was built for and Patrick spent many hours out here mapping the surface with wonderful drawings like these. What he was particularly interested in were the edges of the moon. As it moves around the Earth, it wobbles, and that means we can occasionally see round the corner, not just the familiar face. In fact, 59% of the surface is visible over time. And if you look round the corner, we see a whole new sea, the Mare Orientale. Let's come on now to the 20th century. 
And now we have the first really good photographic atlases. Well, of course, by the early 20th century, photography really had become pretty sophisticated. You got fairly fast emulsions and large telescopes, and a lot of people all over the world were starting to photograph the moon by about 1910. Really, the first, though, really major atlas to be done by photography was that of Pickering in the, in the United States. But very important, of course, Patrick, is your own work, because amateurs have always played a major role in the history of the study of the moon. And, of course, one of your own outstanding discoveries was your own discovery of the Mare Orientalis. It really luck, I think, because I was going down the moon's edge, well, down the very favourable conditions, and the Mare Orientalis is a huge thing, mainly on the far side. A tiny part can be seen on this side, and I just happened to get it. I didn't realise how big it was. Nonetheless, you got it ten years before the Americans saw it, <laughs> which is a great yeah, anyway. British discovery. <laughs> well, shall we go back now into the garden and uh, join our observers there? Patrick's 15-inch telescope was built to look at the moon, and we're going to get some fabulous views tonight. And Pete, we thought we'd start with an old friend. Yes, we're back to Copernicus again, um, and because we're using a, the 15-inch telescope, there's much more light, and you can see that there's a tremendous amount of detail in the crater there. Look at the terraced rim there, and the central peak is quite well defined. You can see it's a multiple central peak as well. The rays from Copernicus reach out and they happen to cover the nearby crater, Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes, and if you look at Eratosthenes, you can see that um, it itself actually overlaps the, uh, the mountain range there, and uh, they're on the edge of the Imbrian Basin. That's right, so that means Copernicus must be younger than Eratosthenes because its material covers it, and then Eratosthenes is younger than That's Imbrian. right, yes. Simple, and if we do this across the whole moon, we can get a sense of order and history. That's right. So, Pete, where next? Well, I thought we'd go down to this, um, this rather nice crater chain here. Um, there's Ptolemaeus, Alphonsus, and Rosarchel. And uh, interestingly, if you look at Alphonsus there, there are some dark patches on its floor. Yes, what are they, Ian? Yes, these dark patches on the, on the floor of Alphonsus are thought to be a dark volcanic deposit produced by fire fountaining, such as you see on places like Hawaii on the Earth. And the three craters in a row, would they be related or are they completely separate events? Um, I, I, it's likely they are related. It's likely that they're um, secondary impacts from the huge impact that produced the Imbrian Basin to the north of them. I'm going to try and find a rill. There we go. This is the Hyginus rill. Um, it's quite a... It's not terribly well defined because of the illumination, but you can make it out there. What is a rill? A rill is a general name given to lunar valleys, essentially, and there are several types. Um, some, some of them are sinuous, like rivers, and they're lava channels. Hyginus rill, which is kind of linear with a kink in the middle, is probably an example of a graben, which bounded by two faults. And in between the two faults, the land surface has subsided. Well, we seem to have absolutely everything in this view. It, it's a great view of the moon, isn't it? I mean, this is a really rich... Um well, feature-rich area of the moon. But on the left there, we've got the Alpine Valley running across. What, what exactly formed the Alpine Valley? Do you know? um, the Alpine Valley is interpreted to be where the lunar crust was fractured by the impact of the huge meteorite that excavated the Imbrian Basin. It is radial to the Imbrian Basin. Um, and since then, it's been flooded with mare basalts. And it cuts through the, the lunar Alps, these, these mountains called lunar Alps, which form part of the, uh, the rim of the Imbrian Basin. And there's an interesting rill that runs down the middle of the valley. There is. There's a sinuous rill that's a, interpreted as a, to be a lava channel that flows down. So right. the main valley is a fault-bounded valley, but it's got a sinuous, uh, has had a sinuous river of lava running down the middle. And the mountains are interesting too, aren't they? Yes, these, these isolated mountains that sort of poke through the surface of Mare Imbrium are the peaks of what was once when the basin formed a multi-ringed impact basin. Apennines give the outer rim, but the inner rim is largely flooded by lavas, and just occasionally particularly high peaks of that inner rim protrude sort of above a sea of lava you just can, to stand out. You can see there's almost a chain there. You can imagine that mm. as oh, a ring, can you? You can fit a circle to them, concentric to the centre of the basin. While we're crossing um, the Mare Imbrium, um, I'll just pan down here to one of my favourite features, which is, there it is, oh, yeah, yes. the Sinus Iridum, which is the Bay of Rainbows. And uh, it's just on the terminator there, there's some very distinct shadows. If you look at the, um, the edge of the uh, sinus iridum there, there's uh, a very distinct triangular shadow. 
And you really see those features are obvious with the sun low in the sky, which of course is why we look at the Terminator, the line between night and day, between light and dark, really picks out these features. It does indeed. You can see why the mappers follow it across the moon so they can pick out the mm -hmm. features at their best. You can really see some uh, uh, tremendous detail in there, can't you? Well, we've shown just some of the highlights from the moon as it is tonight. But of course, things change from night to night as the lighting changes, and features which appear prominent now will be almost invisible in a few days. There's plenty to see on the moon. Everyone knows about the moon illusion. The full moon looks bigger when low down than it does when high up. Actually, it doesn't. It is purely an illusion. And we try to demonstrate that. Richard Gregory joined me on the beach at Celsius to see what we could find out. Anyway, the results of that program are still quoted in scientific journals. Right, will you all look at the moon? Look down at the stones, and now pick up the stone you think will just cover the moon at arm's length, and then try it. And don't please throw the stones away. Keep them. Right? And now I will show you the size of the stone. Will you just do it for me? <laughs> a tiny little stone. May I now please have the stones that you actually selected? And you see, the whole point of this experiment was that I am perfectly certain that everybody selected stones which were much too big. And this is exactly what happened. Look at that collection of stones there, and now look at the right one. When I hold out that little stone at arm's length, that just about covers the moon. And everybody else, predictably, selected stones which are very much too large. Using this apparatus, I reckon we can produce a moon illusion, all right? I think we should. Well, I can see the artificial moon, I can see the iris. So first of all, we'll bring the moon down almost to the horizon until it's sitting almost on top of those wooden posts. And now, Richard, will you increase the iris, which at the moment looks much smaller than the moon? Quite a bit smaller. More than that, increase further. Further still, please. A little bit more, nearly there, a little bit more still. Now, those two now appear the same size to me, although, of course, not the same brightness, because the iris appears much brighter. Now we lift the moon up, and there is quite definitely an apparent shrinkage. There is an illusion there, so there very definitely is an illusion, according to the height of the moon above your horizon. For our last look at the moon tonight, let's go back into the garden, just outside my observatory where Chris and Alan are using a telescope to show just what Galileo must have seen so long ago. Well, we've been looking at the moon in all kinds of telescopes, but when I saw you had a replica of Galileo's, how could we not point it to the moon? So we've attached it to this larger telescope, Alan, so you can have a look. We found the moon, which was surprisingly tricky. What does it look like? It's absolutely remarkable, because unlike anything you see in a modern telescope, you can't even get the whole moon in. And of course, this is exactly what Galileo would have seen initially, all given by two little bits of glass. In fact, what Milton called in Paradise Lost through a Tuscan astronomer's optic tube. And we're still talking about him almost 400 years later. Absolutely. And it's a fitting end to a it night's observing, It really is absolutely Alan. gorgeous. And to see this through there, and to see that, and see now, as it were, as Pliny would have drawn it, as Galileo would have thought of it, and of course, as we can image it today, this is the way in which we can understand the moon. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Alan. Thanks, Chris. So, there is the moon. Do go and look at it with the naked eye, a telescope, or binoculars if you have them. It's a wonderful world. And you know... There's still so much about it that we still don't know.